this is Bobby Newman. I'd like to welcome you to this week's Research Minutes, the CPRI Knowledge Hub's weekly podcast where we interview researchers about the latest work being done in the field to help improve education. This week, I speak with Matthew Steinberg, Assistant Professor of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, about his study that he co-authored with Matthew Kraft. Research is titled, The Sensitivity of Teacher Performance Ratings to the Design of Teacher Evaluation Systems, which was recently featured in Educational Researcher. Matthew, thank you for joining me today. Bobby, thanks for having me. So let me start out by asking you, what are some of the latest efforts to reform teacher evaluation systems? Certainly. In the last five to six years following Race to the Top in 2010, nearly all states, 46 of the 50 states, and nearly all of the largest school districts, 23 of the 25 largest school districts plus the District of Columbia, in largest in terms of student enrollment, have dramatically revised their teacher evaluation system. And so what do these revisions look like? So historically, teacher evaluation systems relied on a single measure of teacher performance, typically one fairly cursory classroom observation where principals or school administrators would use a checklist of teacher practices to observe a teacher, and their summative evaluation rating was based on that typically sole, single classroom observation. The revised teacher evaluation systems in the last five or six years have first incorporated multiple measures of teacher performance. In addition to these more rigorous, rubric-based classroom observations, one of the notable features of these new evaluation systems is the incorporation of student test scores into consequential evaluations of teacher performance. Other teacher performance measures that are incorporated into these new systems include surveys of students that aim to capture students' perspectives about their teacher's performance in the classroom. What's been, again, a feature, a key feature of these new evaluation systems in the last five or six years is the incorporation of multiple categories, typically four categories, with the goal of better differentiating teacher performance than had occurred historically. Though, What we're finding is that even under these new evaluation systems, there's actually limited differentiation. There continues to be limited differentiation of teacher performance. In states like Tennessee and others that received rates of the top funding, more than 95% of teachers continue to be rated in one of the top two of four ratings categories. So again, even with efforts to inject multiple measures of teacher performance into consequential teacher evaluation and multiple ratings categories, we continue to see limited differentiation differentiation around teacher effectiveness. So let me summarize what you said. So some states have adopted um, multiple measures. So you have teacher observation scores, student test scores, and surveys scores folding into their complete evaluation. And states have put weights on each one of those measures. So, for example, a state might have said 40% of your evaluation will be based on observation, 40% will be based on student test scores, and 20% will be based on student survey results. And so those are those measure weights. Is that correct? That's exactly right. So, for example, Chicago Public Schools weights observations of teacher practice around 70% of a teacher's summative evaluation rating and gives 30% of the weight to student achievement measures. Now, again, what's notable about that is that for most teachers in Chicago and nationally, student achievement-based measures will be unavailable. So what happens mechanically in these systems is that the observation weight goes up, right? So in many cases, teachers' evaluation continues to depend almost entirely on the observation score that they receive. So how do the variations in teacher performance measure weights and the placement of ratings affect the distribution of teacher performance ratings? That's a great question, and that's sort of the focus of the paper that that you cited at the beginning of the conversation. And in this paper, what we do is we take data from the Measures of Effective Teaching Study, which was the largest study, largest effort to measure teacher effectiveness. It was done across six school districts, including New York, Charlotte Mecklenburg, and others, and incorporated multiple measures of teacher performance. So we used data from that study from 2009-10. So again, this predates these evaluation reforms, but what was nice about this feature of the MET data is that we have the same measures, observation scores, student achievement-based measures, so these are value-added measures, so value-added scores of teacher effectiveness, and student surveys based on Ron Ferguson's tripod survey. So we have the same measures for the same sample of about 1,200 teachers in grades four through nine across six districts. And what we do is we say, 
If these same teachers with their same performance measures were placed in different evaluation systems, and by different we mean systems that apply different weights to each of the three performance measures, observation, VAM, so student achievement measures and student surveys, and also set different thresholds for what determines whether a teacher is proficient or not, right? So again, these new evaluation systems are using multiple ratings categories, typically four, and so these ratings, these, these evaluation systems treat teachers who are rated level three or four, the top two ratings categories, as proficient. And so what we find is that the, when we change the weights or vary the weights that are assigned to different performance measures, these three measures, observation, VAM, so value-added measures based on student achievement, and student survey scores, we can generate quite different distributions of teacher proficiency. So what does that mean? That means that the decisions that policymakers are making about the weights that are assigned to each of each performance measure that enters into the calculation of a teacher's summative performance, and then where those systems set the proficiency threshold are consequential for determining the distribution and the share of teachers that are deemed professionally proficient. But again, the idea here is that when different evaluation systems at the state and district level have different weight assigned to these measures and set different thresholds for what determines teacher proficiency, the proportion of teachers that are deemed proficient can be very, very different across systems. So it begs policymakers to be thoughtful about the percentages that they're placing on each of the measures. That's exactly right. And so what so what we're arguing is that independent of a teacher's performance, right? So given that we've got the same measures for the for the same sample of teachers, we can look across systems and what the implications might be for different system designs in terms of the weights assigned to measures and the thresholds for teacher proficiency. Independent of a teacher's performance, our findings suggest that the design of the system is consequential and has real implications for what we're saying about whether or not teachers are proficient, which is, which is, again, critical for policymakers to understand in that the decisions that they're making about the weights that are assigned to each measure have real implications for whether a teacher ultimately is seen to be proficient or not in their performance. So you mentioned student survey responses. So how do they affect teacher proficiency rates? Because I know a lot of states don't use student surveys. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And most districts don't either. So on average, at least in our data among our thousand plus teachers from the Measures Effective Teaching Study, student survey scores look very, very similar in, in terms of the average score and the distribution of those scores to observation scores. And notably, both observation scores and student survey scores on average look very different than VAM scores or scores based on student achievement. So certainly, if more weight is given to a measure like student survey compared to a measure like student achievement, this is information derived from students, one from their <laughs> survey responses versus one from their test scores. If we give more weight to a measure like surveys compared to a measure like student test scores, then on average, more teachers will be rated proficient. So... Again, it's important to know that student surveys play a relatively limited role in these in state and district evaluation systems, but it's also important to know, at least from our data, that if systems were to include student surveys and student surveys had similar means and distributions as they do in the MET data, then more weight assigned to those surveys would mean that, on average, teacher scores, teacher performance ratings would be higher. So, do you have any advice as to which teacher performance measures policymakers should pay attention to when designing an, an evaluation system? Yeah, this is a great question. I think the first decision has to be, what do these different performance measures tell us? And how might the informational signals derived from each performance measure provide us with different information? This is in light of, again, the, the, the very low cross-measure correlations that we describe in the paper and that, again, others have shown in other settings where, again, VAM scores or scores based on student test scores are weakly correlated with observation scores and also weakly correlated with student survey scores. So I think the first question for policymakers is, what are we trying to learn about teacher effectiveness from these different performance measures? And based on what we're trying to learn, what value do we ascribe to each of these measures? And the values, right, are implicitly captured by those nominal weights, by the weight that the policy, that policymakers in the evaluation system place on teacher performance measures. And moreover, what do we want to say, what, what, what is the sort of threshold or benchmark that we think determines 
what makes a teacher proficient or not, right? And again, part of these new systems, part of the, one of the major goals of these new systems, right, was injecting greater accountability and providing more differentiation around teacher effectiveness. Now, again, we haven't seen that come to come to fruition in these new systems as most teachers continue to be rated highly effective. So the policymakers really need to consider you know, the extent to which the, the thresholds that are determining teacher proficiency are actually the threshold above which teachers are proficient. And again, what does that mean for teachers to be proficient, right, when teacher proficiency is determined by multiple measures? That's sound advice, Matthew. Thank you again for joining me today to talk about your research. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Research Minutes. To share your thoughts on this discussion, head to KHUB Conversations at cprehub.org. To subscribe to our weekly podcast and listen to more interviews, head to soundcloud.com forward slash CPRI Knowledge Hub. And for the latest videos, podcasts, and discussion updates, follow us at CPRI Hub on Twitter and CPRI Knowledge Hub on Facebook. We look forward to hearing from you.